אוקיי, אנחנו מתחילים. אולי רגע תפני אליו ותגידי לו. אני צריכה ללכת לפה כדי שלא. ואני לא יכולה. כן, פשוט ממול הכיתה, עוד קצת אחורה, עוד קצת אחורה. את רוצה לדבר עליו? אני רוצה לדבר עליו. אז את צריכה לעמוד שם.
And isn't that a much more poetic way of describing the fact that we are in, into a new paradigm or in the post-industrial or all the type of etiquettes we are trying to put on the times we are living? And of course the question is, what is the old and what is the new? And as far as I'm concerned, very much of the old is, what is crumbling now is the mechanical worldview that we have had now for some 100, 150 years. We have made all us fabulous machines. It took us to the moon and it took us back. And somehow we tend to think that we are in control. In control of people or in control of nature. And of course that's not the case. And of course what is now emerging as new is very much borderless, it's global, it's digital, and I must say rather brutal in many ways. But maybe the most important, it's so interconnected into a complexity. It just five, ten years ago wasn't there. Today we start to understand we are all sitting in the same boat. And that's new. And we really don't know how to deal with that. So of course we have to ask ourselves, what does this mean for any project now that we are talking about? And just a few reflections on the old and new logic. I kind of like to just take back a step and say, okay, in the old industrial logic, assets and wealth was very much into the tangibles, as you know, things. But in the new logic, we've said for many years that more of assets are coming into the intangibles, relationships, brand, trust, and so forth, ideas. And of course, if you live in the world of things, then you have a thing, and if you give away a thing, you don't have a thing. But if you live in the world of ideas, and you have an idea, and I have one, and we exchange them, you will end up with two ideas, and I will end up with two. So the more we share, the more we have. And I think that's a really mind-boggling uh, idea that we are shifting from holding to sharing when it is about assets and asset creation. And of course we can have a lot of other examples of old and new here. It's not the purpose of our meeting today. The old is very much in Newtonian worldview and the new is more into the quantum physics. And we know the difference. In the old maybe we will look for teaching, but in the new we tend to rather prefer to see learning. Or we might look for concu nature in the left side here, but it's more about the harmony nature, if you see it in the new logic. Yeah? The type of list like this is not so much about the world, it's more about how we see the world. And if it's anything I learned myself on my own journey, is that we all go around and see the world, not as the world is. We go around and see the world as we are. And that's a profound statement, really, and particularly in leadership, that we understand that people see the world, you know, as they see it. And, you know, I used to say when we expected our first child back in 1972, I've never seen so many baby strollers. You know, it has nothing to do with baby strollers, it's about me. And I think that's for all of us the same. And that's why, of course, when we talk leadership, it's so important to understand how do people see the world? What frame of reference, you know, what mental models are they sitting in? I've been running around with overhead transparencies. This is one of them I've used for 40 years. That's challenging us saying maybe the revolution is from a life that was organized for us, you know, by the king, by the church, by the headquarter, or that we see the world as something that we have to, we are in charge of our own destiny, so we have to create it. And of course, if you look in the first there, you ask for what is the prediction of the future? How will it look like? But if you start on the second, at the bottom here, it's a completely different question that leads us. What future do I want to be part of? creating. And I think you have to agree with me that the future is not the road to be predicted. It's not the road to be discovered. It's still to be created. And the fact that we see the world as something we have to create together, of course, then the leadership question is, what future do we want to create together? Very much what we talk about in, in society, of course, is about the economical aspect of life and particularly in corporations, you could say, but also society at large. But doing that on behalf of an ecological viable future, of course, it's, it's not possible. It's not to be embarrassing when we see what they've done. But even more important, when I travel the world, is people's, you know, interest in the question, and where does little me come into the picture? The more anthropological aspect. My family, my company, my country. And I can't come in now as being president of IKEA North America and just present the plan for the economical aspect. You know, how the owner will make more money. That wouldn't create meaning. So you have to invite people to something that makes sense both on the ecological side and the anthropological side. And all this has to be done relevant to our times. That's kind of my first point. 
Then on the second point, how to organize ourselves. Well, you know, we have one model that some decide and others implement. And that's a good model when we're going to build a house or a road or something very physical. But if you like to invite people to now be creative and, you know, take us to the next level somehow, we have to let loose and invite people to co-create. The problem is when you let loose and give people degrees of freedom, they run with it so you get centrifugal effects. So then we need a center to keep things together. And what is that center? Well, in my experience, it's about the question, why are we here? Or the question has been a bit more sharp over years. The question is now, who would miss us if you weren't here? And I think that's a very good question that you can bring in on the project level or a corporate level. Because in a business context, of course, we are here to make, enable customers to do something that they couldn't do if you weren't here. To enable co-workers to grow into something that we couldn't do if you didn't do it together. To make society a better place to live in. And if we have this model to give shareholders their return, that's kind of a given. But you know that very much of business over the last 10, 15 years have tilted towards being shareholder driven. The purpose of business is about creating shareholder value, period. And I think that's as stupid as to say that the purpose of life is oxygen. We need oxygen to live. You need to make money to be business, of course. But life is much more complex and much more exciting than oxygen. And it's the same with business. We have to go into that complexity of customers, society, co-workers. That's where creativity sits and that's, that's where meaning sits. So the, que the why question, you see I've used somebody here that has more credibility than myself. Uh, it's extremely important, and I think, uh, at least for me in my experience, it's very useful also somehow to going back to the basic purpose. And if you think like this, the organizing principle is not what is good for our company. The question is, what is our company good for? Maybe for some, this is playing with words. For me, this is two different landscapes that opens up. So, just a little short break. Do you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Do you see the, the slides? Yes. 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 Okay. Can I continue like this? Is this okay? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Great. Yes. Okay. <laughs> so, if this was just some reflections that generally on leadership, there's so much more to say, of course, but then there are two questions here that really I'm engaged in you know, deeply. And I think that's, of course, the question about the sustainable future. What is it and why is it not optional? why it is absolutely at the center of everything we have to do. And once we understand that, what is the type of transformation and change that we need in order to, to, get, to go there and to get there? And I'd like to share a few reflections on that. And of course, when we talk sustainability, you know that this is a long list about a lot of issues, and they are interconnected, all of them, as you know, and big challenges. All of them. But for me, the key question here is why? And I'm convinced if we don't have the why sitting down here, if it just sits up here, you know, this is important, we won't make it. So, I have three pictures I'd like to share with you that has been very important for me to get into the why. Why this issue is so important and critical. The first is the one, this one from the natural step, you know, 25 years ago, when the natural step defined planet Earth as a system, which causes then a closed system in terms of materia. It's the same molecules that we turned around this four billion years ago. The only one that is renewed in the system is the photosynthesis, the green cell. And the only thing that is entering the system is solar energy from outside. In an enormous amount, as you know, every day is enough to give us energy for a full year for the whole world. The question is how to capture it and how to store it. And once we understand this and really take these conditions, which are not negotiable, this is the framework for all of us. Then I think we tend to understand that the ecosystem is the headquarter and the economy is the daughter company. It's not the other way around. And that's I think is a profound insight. So the second picture that has been important for me is since we took this one of this beautiful planet Earth, which of course is a spaceship. We are on our way traveling. You know, we've been on here four billion years. And on this spaceship, we were only two billion people hundred years ago. And now we are 7 billion. And soon we are 10 billion people. So the idea that we, with 10 billion people on this spaceship, have to rethink how we use our resources, renewable or not renewable ones, is kind of an obvious, it's a given. 
And the third picture then, for me that is also really dramatic is this one. And I guess most of you have seen it. This, if you saw it in the Al Gore movie, for example, this is the I course uh, that I have taken up from Antarctica, where we know the uh, temperature of the planet 400,000 years back. And we know the concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere 400,000 years back. And of course, this has been a rather stable period in terms of climate. Still, we had four ice ages, 12,000 years here on this graph. We had one kilometer of ice where I'm standing in northern Europe. So, of course, climate is shifting. It has to do with sun axle, earth axle, and so forth. But the drama in this picture is that never before have we been above 300 parts per million. And why? where are we now? Well, we started to worry here. Now we have passed 400, and we are on our way to 500, 600, maybe 700 parts per million. And why is that? Well, we know it's because we are burning coal, oil, and gas, you know, and the way we live. And when we burn coal, oil, and gas, it becomes CO2. And we know where the CO2 is going. It goes into the photosynthesis, into the trees, into the oceans. But the ecosystem can only take in one and a half ton per person per year. But we are producing four and a half or five ton per person per year. And of course, the, di the difference accumulates up in the atmosphere. And of course, if now the theory from this Swedes, Sweden in the 1890s, we got the Nobel laureate uh, who made the link between temperature and concentration of, of, of climate gases, if it's true, which we tend to see, because we're even changing the climate now, as you know, of course, and we're in for some really terrible things to happen. And that's why this is the biggest question of our time. And of course, if the Siberia tundra start to leak methane, you know, then what we're doing is, is nothing. You know, it's an enormous amount of things that we can start to undo here. And of course, that's where the scary part is in, in this picture. So, I guess these are things you know, but of course, I'm just coming to the point, we need a new way of thinking. And I think this beautiful quote from Einstein is exactly what it's all about. We have done what we've done, we haven't maybe understood, now we understand, it's time to rethink and find a new way of thinking. And I'm absolutely convinced from where the inspiration will come, it will come from nature itself. Peter Senge, Peter Senge and I wrote an article back in 2001 when we just claimed, you know, the inspiration from nature because nature is an absolutely wonderful system. The, wo the word waste hasn't been invented yet, as you know. The leaf falls now here, that goes into a, a new living loop. But the industrial system as we know it, or as we have done it, it's a linear system. Take, make, and waste. So it's obvious we have to go from a linear thinking to the circular. We have to go from concrete nature to living in harmony with nature. That's where the challenge is. And of course, when and if we decide to do so and let the human creativity loose, we can do that. There's absolutely no restrictions on it. But we have to address it. Otherwise, of course, we are busy doing other things. So let me then, since we are on the leadership agenda, just share a few examples of where people are trying to address this. And I will start with a very controversial example, Walmart. You know, one of the biggest companies in the world. And they are criticized for everything, as you know. They are the, really the dirty growth machine. And back in 2006, this guy here, Lee Scott, the CEO at the time, he gathered 250 of his top managers, saying, you know, we've been out listening now. Why are we in conflict with the world we're living in? And this year of listening, we also saw that Katrina in New Orleans happened. And he was there physically. And he said, if you don't understand that we saw it, what we saw in New Orleans, that was the environmental problems in slow motion. And then he went on by saying, and when I see what this company has done for the last 10, 15 years on the green agenda, and maybe what normally all big companies have done, it's just bullshit and PR. If you don't understand that we have completely to redirect ourselves, we won't be around 20, 30 years from now. So then he went on, we need to completely go in another direction renewable, no waste, and so forth. And of course, this is inspirational, it's ambitious, we don't know exactly how to get there, and it will take time, but we know the way. We know the direction. And by the way, they were also influenced by the natural step, I think, in their thinking, we know that. Anyway, he said, remember now, we will not be measured now by our press releases or our promises, we will be measured by our actions. So please, we have to get to work. And then he put up some five-year targets, three-year targets, seven-year targets, and so forth. I just like to relate to this 
as a leadership example because you know first of all when Walmart as a big company decides to double fuel efficiency in the transportation that changes the landscape because when the track producer like Volvo comes to Wall Street and they say how more efficient are your tracks Mr. President of Volvo it has to be 20-30% at least because the biggest transport buyer in the world have decided to go that way and by the fact this they did we know that by now we have the data of that from the result and the other thing is that when they say we're going to go towards zero waste for example without knowing how what is happening then well, all experts in the world are, com are coming running with solutions. So that's another dynamics that is kicking off. And of course, this is also takes some courage because this is a quoted company in the stock exchange. And of course, the people there say, what is going on? We have a Greenpeace guy running Walmart. This sounds dangerous. And he can stand there and say, well, maybe it's good. We'd be driving some costs, but it's about value creation. We need to do this. So that's an interesting example. Unilever came a couple of years later with their plan to double sales and reduce footprint with 50%. This is an extremely ambitious thing. Mm -hmm. And again, they don't know exactly how to do it, but they do it very transparent. They invite everybody to come in and help in the whole value chain into the Indian village and so forth. And the guy who is kind of running this is, of course, Paul Pullman, CEO since 2010. And he said, we can't do have the business in an unhealthy society. So we have to do it. And it's, you know, we have to speed up. As a matter of fact, right now, he's trying to mobilize 2 billion people on social media to put pressure on politicians and on corporate leaders to move faster on the climate agenda. And he also canceled the, th the three-month uh, quarterly results reporting, by the way. My old company, IKEA, has also, after 25 years, come to a point where they have a very ambitious plan on people and planet positive. As you can see, fossil free and and renewable and so forth and also when it comes to suppliers and, and, and people and living, living conditions for people around the world. And they're trying to really incorporate it into their business idea. That is, why should people, only the rich people, be able to live a sustainable life? Buying hybrid cars or having solar panels on their roofs? Because IKEA's business idea is to provide things for the home at prices so that many people can afford it. That's kind of our key ideas. So now they are integrating this, also being able to live a sustainable life for families. They like to find solutions that are more affordable. So you see, then they start to build it into their business. Mm -hmm. They started back in 90, when I was there, I was there between 1990 and 1997, and we really kicked it off by bringing that to a step in to educate all employees and all suppliers all over the world. And that's what kind of so setting off the why question, I think. And, and of course, it's been a long journey since then. I was working two years with the Clinton Climate Initiative. And just backtracking, you know, if the big companies don't try to, if they don't find business models where they can start to invest into renewables and zero waste, I don't think we will get there. Because we need to get these bigger organizations in for that transition. But of course, then it has to be business models can make sense of it. The same we did here in the Clinton Climate Initiative, because it was a project to address practical, measurable, and scalable ways of reducing uh, greenhouse gas emissions. It had many different projects. One was with the biggest 40 cities in the world that I was leading to start up. And of course, when you go into the cities, you know the principal answer. We have to reduce energy consumption because we are wasting so much, and the remaining energy has to be renewable. So if you come into New York now, what is the energy going? Well, it goes 60% goes to heating and cooling buildings. So of course we have to start by a giant program of retrofitting, retrofitting the existing buildings. It's not enough to build new good buildings. And this was one example. We worked with creating waste into energy and transport and so forth. I don't have time to go into that. A lot of cities today have a good climate plan. New York has one, Tokyo, Paris and so forth. And of course, it's about going addressing issues like buildings, transport, waste, and so forth. And there are today a lot of good solutions, as you know, to address this, but we don't really make them happen. Maybe I can take one little example on the building side. There are companies, Siemens, Honeywell, Schneider, who can, can, can come in and take down the energy consumptions with 20, 30, 40 percent, and they guarantee the results and the saving. And still it doesn't happen. Why? 
by the building's owners are in one corner and the the tenants are in the others who get the saving. The technicians in the third corner and the banks are going to fund, fund it are in a separate corner and they don't come together. And I used to say that is good to work with President Clinton because when he called, people don't hang up. So somehow we can gather the type of people around the table that is needed. And I think that's very much what this is all about, taking a more holistic view on the problems. Talking, going from intentions to actions, we have to manage in China. Mm -hmm. I've had the fortune of being out there for the last 15 years and seen a dramatic transition around 2007, 2008, when they decided really to go another way. And I've been sitting with the absolute top, top people there, and they say, why, you hear, we hear a lot of thunder and see no rain from you guys from America and Europe. You talk a lot, but you don't do it. You know, the first industrial revolution that put us on opium, we were sleeping. The second, the IT, that was China, that was India, no, sorry, that was Japan, it was America, it was impressive. The third, the green, we like to be part of leading. And I think there's something deep in that position on their side. They are now investing heavily, as you know, in wind, in solar cell, in solar collectors, and so forth, electricity. And of course, it's amazing. It took them two years to produce more solar heat collectors than the world altogether. And of course, what happens with cost and the learning curve, you can, you can just imagine. The attitude or the leadership uh, thinking, I have a quote here from Deng Xiaoping. You know, he's been through three revolutions, and he said, if you like to now set a new direction, transform our society, set the direction, and trust the future generation will be wiser. The leader themselves will only be in power for a decade at the most. It's neither feasible nor necessary for them to reach the goals of that. Completion will take several generations. All that is needed is now is the commitment. And you see, I like that a lot when you talk about leadership. In many of these instances, it's about making a commitment to a new trans trajectory, without maybe knowing exactly how to get there and when. And of course, don't misunderstand me, China has dramatic problems on the environmental side, enormous problems, but they're also a very firm commitment to try to do something about it. I'm kind of worried when I'm in Europe and Sweden, people say, well, China is the big problem of climate. Well, it is not China, it's the US. You know, they didn't sign Kyoto and so forth. But be careful here also. There are a lot of things going on. It's Silicon Valley, it's venture capital, it's California, it's pro-science, pro-technology, pro-business, pro-risk. It's a very entrepreneurial and it's bubbling of new inventions and innovations all over the place. So really we see America here on the one side, we see China. And of course, what is it about? It's about millions of jobs and trillions of dollars, we can say, for the next 20, 30, 40 years. Because we are right now in an extremely interesting period. We have to find new products, new processes and business models and new ways to collaborate and so forth. And we are just here in the beginning. And as far as I'm concerned, sustainability is not only an ethical imperative anymore. It has become a business imperative. Because I'm absolutely convinced that countries and regions and cities and companies, they don't really see, if they don't see this, they will be left behind. And of course, the business imperative, you could say there are three dimensions to it, or three interesting aspects. The first is just to reduce risk. I mean, we have a Swedish energy company now that 10 years ago invested into coal in Germany, and they are being killed now, of course, by losing money. So reducing the risk by understanding the landscape you're entering, that's already that important. But also, in order to recruit the most talented people or talented capital or customers and so forth, we need to be on the solution side. But maybe most important, to really take on the sustainability challenge is to put an innovative pressure or pressure on innovation. And that's very and extremely interesting, I think, for any company to take on. You know that this meeting is now coming up, end of this month, and uh, whatever is going to come out, it's extremely important. Uh, as you heard, uh, President Obama, I think a month ago, said that it's obvious now we are the first generation to know what we are about to uh, address, and we are the, the last generation to be able to address it. So we are both the first and the last. We are in a very critical moment. And of course, we have to have, still be hopeful for this meeting. 
Yeah, I'm coming back a little bit to that later. But seeing a lot of things going on in the world, yes, it's bubbling over it, but of course it's not enough. We are still far from where we have to be, and we are still in front of a tremendous challenge. Just to quote President Clinton in a dinner we had, he said, I was struck by the countries that won't meet the Kyoto targets. Remember, 170 signed, but only 10 delivered on their commitment. They aren't lazy and stupid, they're not corrupt, they're well-meaning, hard-working, like all political leaders are facing all kinds of competing pressures in an economy that is not organized for tomorrow's energy, it's organized for yesterday's. And you see, that's true. So even when you start to understand that we have to get out of the old, it's naive to think that we just can jump out of it. We are stuck in our balance sheets, in our technologies, and of course that creates this dilemma. And the question then, how do we then get the transformational change to happen? And then I come to my second point here on the leadership agenda. That is, I think this is a bigger question. It's not only now on the environmental side, because most of us, I guess it's true for more in Israel as well, are kind of worried with our school system and our healthcare system. Maybe we have an institutional problem. Maybe our institutions, you know, the organizations, the way we have organized them, are not capable of dealing with the complexities of today. Maybe they are not as machines, they are more like living communities. What do I mean with that? Well, you know, most organizations, they are department, 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 responsibility, 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 and then people are sitting up here in management boards expected to make decisions as if it was to push a button or pull a lever to make things happen down here that we expect to happen. That's a very, very mechanical worldview. You push that button and you get your results. I never had somebody said, yes, I think my organization is like a machine, and I will probably never meet one. But I can get a lot of invitations to come and have presentations on how do we drive change, or how do we drive innovation. Well, it's interesting, we drive cars, we drive machines, but have you tried to drive your teenagers? Or have you tried to make a plan to change your wife? Well, we can laugh at it, it doesn't work. I can't see your faces now, but I guess you would agree with me, you know, that's ridiculous. But still, when we get into our institutions, we are expected to drive change and drive innovation, or maybe change the corporate culture. Listen to that, change the culture, as if it were spare parts to replace. So I'm very doubtful, so to say, with the idea of coming from above with implementation programs. It's about imposing, telling, teaching, implementing. I started with another model that is more about co-creation and learning. And I think uh, the idea of when teaching fails, try learning, says a lot of the dramatic difference with a teaching perspective and a learning perspective. And I think we have more to learn from biological metaphors, when it talks about talking leadership, than from mechanical metaphors. You see, if I have a plant here and I shout, grow! It probably doesn't happen that much. Well, somebody said there's some CO2 coming out of this. Maybe that can happen. Or somebody came with a metaphor or the example, it all may take nine months to deliver a baby, independent of how many people you put on the project. <laughs> it doesn't help to put more resources. We can't apply more force. It doesn't help to push. Because some things in life takes time. Learning takes time. Building trust between people takes time. Making people see, making people see something that they didn't see takes time. And I think this is very important to keep in mind when we talk leadership on these agendas. So, what if change is less about reorganizing, restructuring, and re-engineering? Can you hear how mechanical these words are? It's more about reconceiving. That is helping people to see something they didn't see. Seeing the world with new eyes, as we said. What if people don't mind change, but, but they mind being changed? What is true for me, and probably is true for you, most of you. What if people don't let my managers, but by good ideas? And that's where I started. We need to have ideas that are meaningful, learningful, inspiring, that people say, wow, is it what you're going to do? Great, I'm in. I'd like to be part of this. I very often tend to get these questions, so I might as well try to reflect on it before I end. And of course, when I am asked, 
what do you think about now the climate agenda or the sustainability down the road here? And to be honest with you, on my left side here, you know, the intellectual part, I can't be very optimistic. When we see the dramatic challenges in front of us, and you see the inertia, and you see the self-interest in keeping the old, it would be naive to say, well, this will take care of itself or somehow it will be solved. But of course, we have to stay hopeful in our everyday work. And when I refill my hope, I go back to the Industrial Revolution. That was a dramatic transformation of our societies of that time. Remember, there was no plan there, no starting point, no leader, no organization that was in charge of the Industrial Revolution. It came through a million small beginnings, making things better, outpouring our creativity, people starting to see something new that they wanted, that it was part of creating. And isn't that hopeful? Because then all of us can be part of the million small beginnings. When you sort out your waste at home or you take your buy your fuel car or little Sweden or little Gothenburg or little Israel, you know, is trying to do something. That is part of the million small beginnings. And I think it's the only model we can hope for. The alternative would be you to expect the church to come in and make the plan and change the world. I don't think that will happen. And we don't have to go back 150 years. Already this example, that has been well researched, as you know, having smoke been forbidden of, of public places, it starts with science, then a few people say, you know, I don't let them eat into my restaurant or to my airplanes, and people say, you will go bankrupt, but it doesn't happen. Then the 15, 20% have changed, the rest follows. So there are social tipping points. That is also hopeful, I think. But the key here is it has to be seen as something desirable. You know, this sustainable future, we cannot come there by solving a problem, by taking out something we don't want. We have to see something we want to create, where we like to go. Remember, Martin Luther King said, I have a dream. He didn't say, I have a nightmare. <laughs> but of course, he was living a nightmare. We know that. But this is such a powerful example of the power of having a vision where we like to, so to say, create together. I started with a quote from Václav Havel. I guess you know who he was. I mean, he was in opposition of the Soviet regime in Czechoslovakia. And he was thrown into prison many, many times. And I'm sure he was also asked many times, can you still be optimistic, Václav, after all these years? And he wrote this letter to his wife from prison. It has become a classical one, when he said, optimist, my dear wife. That's an expectation based on the evidence at hand that there's a reasonable likelihood of a positive outcome. A wonderful description of what optimism is, an extrapolation. Will it succeed or not? But then he continued by saying, but hope, my dear wife, that's something completely different. Hope is the certainty that something makes sense, regardless of how it might turn out. And this is very profound. That's why we have to ask ourselves, where do we like to put our hearts? What do we like to do with our lives? Where would we like we to commit to our own journey? It's not a matter of extrapolation of, of success. It's more about what is really meaningful for us. I have a friend out in San Francisco, Paul Hawking. He is a heavyweight when it comes to the sustainability agenda. I guess you, you know of him. And he says, if you look at science about what's happening on Earth and you're all pessimistic, you don't understand data. That's clear language. But then he goes on by saying, but when you meet the people who try to do something about it, and if you're not optimistic, you haven't got the pulse. And I think that's exactly where we are. Something old is decaying, a lot of things are still going in the wrong direction, but something new is painfully trying to be born. And that's coming very much from below, and it's bubbling over. And, uh, that's why we have to stay hopeful, but we have also to stay humble, because we are dealing with very complex systems, as you know. Of course, this is the classical picture of the unintended consequences. This guy doesn't see the whole system, and of course, we know what's going to happen there. And, and uh, that's why we have to somehow take a level up from the systems view. We can't solve the problem, you know, in addressing the different parts. We have to start to see the whole system. I think that's one of the key aspects and also behind the natural steps philosophy that is so important. 
and so helpful. Because it's about now liberating creativity and how is that done? Well, it comes through a meaningful cause. We know that. When we somehow see meaning, that's when we release our energy and creativity and that's when things happen. And what can be more meaningful than trying to create a desirable, sustainable future? Well, that was my rushed introduction to you guys. I uh, hope you have been able to hear what I'm saying. And now we have some 10 minutes to uh, hopefully reflect together a little again, again and together. And normally what I do, and of course I met Maya and others up in, in Sweden, instead of you now putting some questions, I would like you to take five minutes to talk to each other and just say, what did we hear? What did he say? Was anything of that what he said interesting? Of, of, or maybe something worth talking about or reflecting on? And out of that, we can put up uh, some, take some questions. Is that okay? Yeah. Perfect. Thank so please, you. So please take five minutes, Maya. You can organize that and, and, and really reflect on what did we hear? What the hell did he say? <laughs> Thank you, Joran. We'll take the five minutes. Okay. <laughs>
Yes, Yaron, we are just collecting the final questions and we're just going to read them to you. Yaron, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. So we had a, a, a bit of discussion here and we collected several questions. What Do you rather hear all of them then answer or one by one? What would be better? I just have six, have six minutes to so take a few of them, but you can continue. It's more important that you continue talking. Mm -hmm. But let me hear a few of them. Okay, so I'll ask a few questions and uh, three, four questions and what you can answer would be great. So the first one is to see many examples of leadership and sustainability in NGOs and in the private sector, yet we see only a few examples of sustainability leadership in political leadership. So the question is how can it be increased, the political leadership, and is it important to your opinion? And how will the relationship between politics and private sector evolve as we deal more and more with sustainability challenges? So the first one is about the political leadership. So, sorry, I, I really didn't hear much of that question. Was it about the, the relationship between business and politics? Was that what you said? No, it is about the political leadership. Yes. The so, so the question is about the lack of the political will and how do we increase yeah. the political will? Okay, sorry, now I heard much better. Well, again, I think when we start on that, of course, it's difficult. I think it's dangerous to just sit back and say, okay, we need better political leaders, you know, the politicians are too short term, which is true. But again, we have what we have. And I think we have to work hand in hand. And, Sometimes, you know, by showing that there are possibilities to to make real differences, then it's easier for politicians to come in with legislation. Sometimes we need legislation in order to make things happen. So this is kind of going hand in hand. And I think we have just to accept we are in the same boat, and uh, we have to start where we are. And what can we do, you know, if where we are in, in a city or in a company? Or, it's like the example we had with retrofitting buildings with the Clinton Climate Initiative by doing the Empire State Building with 40% energy reduction. When we proved that that was possible, because everybody said it was not possible, you know, it was not possible to make money on the blah, blah, blah. But when it was done, of course, it's much easier for political leaders to come in and make legislation and say, we need to go towards tougher standards. So we have to show each other examples. I think that's for me, this is a combination. and We shouldn't sit and waiting the other to go before. We need all of us to go. And of course, like now, when political leaders meet in, in Copenhagen, in, in, in Paris. I don't think many of us think that will change the world, but it is an important part of the journey when somehow new agreements and the new countries come in and show. And I must say, I follow a lot of French uh, media and, and the fact that the President Hollande and uh, Laurent Fabius, the foreign minister, how they have committed themselves now to this meeting in Paris that this is the most important thing that 
they are political foxes, I mean, but still I can see how they commit. So, so there is a change in that, you know, so at least I like to stay hopeful with that, but then we have all of us to, to pull in and, and do what we can do. That would be my question. Another question was regarding business, whether they can evaluate the external costs, and if you think that business should pay for that, evaluate the external costs. Well, of course, that's a very good question. We know the reason why we are in problem is because we have these externalities, which nobody's paying for, and of course, which is ridiculous. And of course, that's why when we have to put the carbon, price on carbon, as we've done in Sweden, 1990, for $100 per ton, People think that you would go bankrupt. No, that has helped the country to become more efficient. So, of course, we need to put prices on this. And, of course, it's easy to say. Sometimes you can find better solutions that you don't have to incur so much cost on externality. So I have no really easy answer to that. We need to, of course, incorporate those true costs to our, to our products and to our business calculations and to our GDP and of course GDP is such as a measure I think only when I was young Robert Kennedy said GDP measures everything without besides what's more important in life and of course that is the lousy measurement of, of, of development but still we are stuck with it so but you know probably that a lot of people are trying to get new measures of development and, and uh, we need to go there and, and of course that's where we have to incorporate other values so again, I have no good answer on that, on the solution, but it's a very important question, yes. And a lot of people are working on it. And, and maybe some question which is related. Uh, we'll take two more questions. Is it good? Okay. Um, a question that is related. Do you think that even when it hurts the bank account and it doesn't make sense for a business to do the sustainability work, should it really evolve it in its business? Yeah, but you see, for me, if you have the why question, you don't start with just say, okay, this is more costly. You just say, okay, we have to find the solution. Sometimes maybe the solution looks more costly to start. I've seen many examples of that, and maybe it's not possible to do. But sometimes when you push yourself further, you have to redefine the product or the service, and you will come out with something that is maybe less expensive. I have many examples of that as well. So I think really the push, that's why I said innovation, you have to push innovation because we, the human creativity is so unbelievably enormous, you know. So we start to really look for a solution. We can find them. Or if we don't find them, we have to create them. So that's why the why question that we know we have to go there. Because if you start up here and say, oh, this is important. Let's find a product that is more sustainable. It's more costly. And then you try to sell it. It doesn't sell. It's like, it didn't work. You know, that's not enough. I mean, because that circle, of course, is obvious and it's a risk. But it has to go deeper than that. That's where innovation has to kick in. And uh, thank you. And the last question, although you would be happy to know that there are many more questions here, yes. uh, the last would be maybe if you can address a bit of the challenges in Israel, because we are a small country, and you addressed big countries. Maybe something that could be relevant for here. And well, Sweden, Sweden is even smaller than you, I guess. You know, and and again, you know. Some of you have been in Sweden, and, and I think that, that the sustainability agenda has been there for many, many years for different reasons. And of course, business always claim that when there is new legislation and new things that has to be done, it's going to go bankrupt. But it's never proven to be the case. On the contrary, it pushes innovation and it makes you know the companies more efficient. So uh, that's one argument. The other argument is that we are too small. You know, it doesn't make a difference for the world what we do. I think that's a very dangerous thought because, you know, when Sweden, for example, says it's better to put the money outside Sweden because the efficiency per dollar is higher outside, and that's true, but we have only one way to change the world, and it's to go and show that we can live a life that is good quality of life, you know, maybe within the limit of, of uh, two, three ton per person in, in, in climate, in, in, in CO2 emissions, for example. So we have to push ourselves. So we have to prove to be an example, and then we're part of the million small beginnings, and that will also probably give us a good, better future, because then our products can be sold and we can create wealth. So I think we should not hide behind being a small country or a small city or a small company. Uh, we can still make the difference. And I think you have high tech in your company. You have a lot of competent people, the most brilliant brains. You know, a lot of them 
comes out of your country. So, of course, you can do this. But if I have to run off because I have another meeting, people sitting waiting on me. And I have to say, I feel it feels a little bit strange to talk to you in front of a camera. And I really don't know. I can't see your faces. But hopefully, there is something you can pick up that is of any value. So good luck, and, and uh, it was good to, to you. have you listening. Thank, Thank you very much. much. אם אתם רוצים לשאול אותו רשימת שאלות קודם כל, תראה אני מצטערת, אבל כבר לא היה, וגם לא רק שהיה פה שאלה.